Welcome to our third quarterly installment of the Be Your Best HR webinar series. Uh, we're coming to you today live from our uh, uh, studios, BLC Digital Strategies here in Tyson's Corner, uh, led by our fearless uh, Todd Castleberry at the uh, production studio in the next room. And uh, I'm Declan Leonard. I'm managing partner here at Berenswag Leonard, and I also head up the firm's employment law practice. And I'm Amber Orr. I'm a senior associate at the firm, and I work frequently with Declan on employment law matters. So Amber, this is great. Um, I'm so glad you're joining me with this. I mean, as you say, I'm in your office like 9 million times a day. So <laughs> we do work very closely on this. So uh, uh, I think, you know, this will just be kind of a good discussion. Uh, uh, we are taking questions. We've got a number of HR folks uh, that are watching this today. Uh, uh, and and we're also taping this, so we'll be sending this out afterwards. Um, but the topic that we chose today, and again, the purpose of the Be Your HR Best webinar series is really kind of a forward-looking yeah, we're employment lawyers. Uh, 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 you know, sometimes we don't always see the the the, the proactive. Sometimes uh, our clients come to us with the reactive. Isn't that right? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah. So so um, uh, uh, the onboarding process. I mean, you know, as as we did the write up for this, it was you know we use the cliche and you, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Um, it's so true. It sets the right tone in the employment relationship. I definitely agree, and especially with such a large remote workforce these days, mm -hmm. it's really important to set those expectations from the start. Yeah. And in fact, we're going to get to that. That's one of our topics today is just, you know, kind of managing a hybrid remote workplace. Um, but let's jump into this. Uh, we've got uh, uh, about an hour, uh, give or take, uh, uh, for this uh, for this webinar today. Um, so we want to cover some ground. Uh, we're also going to be taking questions, as I said before, and hopefully they show up here on my phone uh, when they do. Sorry, I just got to get that off. Um, okay. So first thing we were going to talk about um, in the beginning of the employment relationship, you know, you start, you get your offer letter, and you, uh, uh, sorry, you get your offer letter, and you, and you show up. Offer letter versus employment agreement. I mean, we see we see these being used all the time. You know, sometimes interchangeably. Yeah. What 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 are you, what are you seeing out there when 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 it comes to companies? Definitely a mix. Some companies prefer just an offer letter. Some an employment agreement. Some do both as well, which is completely fine. Yeah, and it's interesting because like people think there's a big difference, and there are there probably is. I mean, I think offer letters tend to be uh, 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 less formal. Yeah. They're a little bit more uh, maybe touchy feely type thing. Uh, employment agreements are, of course, you know, just kind of like you know they're 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 they're, they're the way they are. Um, but what's the purpose of these things? Really to, again, outline the expectations of the position and give the employee more information about benefits that they will receive. And then also um, if, you know, the employment is contingent on any outside things like government approval, we want to make sure that the employee is aware of that in the offer letter as well. That's a big part. That's a big, uh, great point. And it's, a, it's, it's key to put that, whether you put that in an employment agreement or an offer letter. I feel like companies that use employment agreements, and by the way, just because you're still an at-will employee doesn't mean you can't use an employment agreement because it's not like the employment agreement is going to say you have a guaranteed job for a certain period of time. It still just reiterates that you're an at-will employee. Yeah. I would say the opposite is stress is that this is at-will, so there's no misunderstanding or misinterpretation about that at all. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and so I think employment agreements, while they may be a little more formal, a little less personal at the start of the employment relationship, I feel like that's where companies tend to dot the I's and cross the T's a little bit better than offer letters. Offer letters, at least in my experience, and I'd be interested in what you've seen, they kind of come in all shapes and sizes. I never know what I'm going to find when I see one. Yes, I agree. Definitely offer letters are kind of more short and sweet um, and to the point versus the employment agreement is a little bit longer and a little bit more legal um, legal ease included with it. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about things that we would see in these documents and, and what we want to see in these documents. Um, like we said, in an employment agreement, you know, you usually have various paragraphs that are, that are, that follow, you know, you usually kind of see a lot of the same ones. Um, you'll see it's more uh, common in an employment agreement that you'll see things like confidentiality. Mm -hmm. You might see some restrictive covenants like a non-solicit or a non-competition. Yeah. The problem I see with an offer letter is 
I don't see those provisions making their way in there very often. Yeah, the offer letter normally does not include those contractual clauses like the confidentiality or the non-compete. That's normally reserved for the employment agreement itself. So the employment agreement usually at the very end has signatures. It usually has you know the company representative and then the employee both signing it. So it's a pretty clear contract. How mm -hmm. how can you how can you sort of do the same thing for an offer letter? Uh, definitely, you know, sign here if you accept this offer and return it by whatever date. And then if there is an employment agreement that you want to include with the offer letter, include that as an attachment as well. Okay. So that's, that's a question I get a lot of times. Uh, can you use both? Yes. Like, can you use both? Okay. Mm -hmm. But what's, what are some things you need to watch out for? If you're going to use an offer letter and an employment agreement, what do you need to watch out for? <laughs> Consistency, of course. Ah, yeah. We don't want any conflicting terms between the offer letter says this, but the employment agreement says that. So consistency is the biggest thing to consider always. And it probably makes sense that the employment agreement going forward is going to be the media document. So it probably makes sense to have a provision in the employment agreement that says in the event of any kind of a conflict mm -hmm. between the two, the employment agreement is probably going to trump the offer letter. Um, okay. So let's talk about a couple of other things that, that you should at least try to paper um, at the beginning of the uh, uh, relationship, whether it's in an offer letter or if it's in a uh, uh, employment agreement. One thing that has come up in COVID, more so in COVID than before, is where do I work? Yeah. Explain how that's become an issue. It seems such an elementary question. Yeah, so definitely with a remote workforce, people, they may start in one state, but then move to another state. And that's really important because moving to another state can trigger different benefits under certain um, state laws, but then also for FMLA leave. And where is that employee um, reporting to for that headcount to see if the company is, um, if the company falls on FMLA or not? Yeah, it's such a, it, it, it seems so elementary, but like, let's just say with COVID, you know, you're a Virginia based company and uh, you had an employee who said, you know what, it's, it's, it, it's, it's better in Colorado. I'm going to move to Colorado. Can I do my job in Colorado? And company says, yes. So then the question is like, is that then a Colorado employee? And, 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 and it's a complicated answer depending on like what you mean, like for unemployment insurance, various yeah. things. You mentioned the Family Medical Leave Act. Family, and we're certainly not going to get too deep into that, <laughs> uh, but the Family and Medical Leave Act basically applies to companies who have 50 or more employees mm -hmm. within a 75 mile radius. And so does that employee that's working in Colorado, like, uh, do, they, do they relate back to the Virginia headquarters in order to qualify for FMLA? And, and, and you rightly said you can solve that mystery from the get-go by putting in either their offer letter or their employment agreement your, you know, Virginia shall be considered your home base office for purposes of, you know, application of laws, yeah. something along those lines. I, before COVID, you and I probably would never have put that in. Yeah. And then also putting in, you know, if the employee moves, requiring them to provide notice at least 60 days in advance, just so the company is aware if there's any other obligations they may be um, out there for that state that, that they moved to. I mean, you have become the expert here at the firm, I feel like, <laughs> in the state-by-state -state laws. Um, you know, whether it's leave laws, whether it's pay transparency laws, uh, 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 restrictive covenants like non-competes, every state is just getting into the mix, New York yeah. being the, the newest one. But, um, and so that's another aspect, you know, that why you want to define where they work. Yeah, especially with the employment agreements. And if you want to put restrictive covenants in there, there may be different requirements for different states and timing that needs to be followed to make sure it's valid. Well, let's talk about that just a little bit. So um, you've got an employment agreement and it's not uncommon, especially for higher level employees, um, it's not uncommon to see uh, 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 restrictive covenant, mm -hmm. uh, non-compete, non-solicitation. You know, um, when you say there are time limits, explain that on a, on a state by state basis. So I'll use DC for an example. If you want to impose a non-compete against an employee, you must give them that non-compete 14 days before their employment starts for it to be valid. That's just one of many other factors that you have to meet but the 14 days is really important especially if you're if there's a situation where you're trying to onboard someone as quickly as possible we have to take that into consideration yeah so when we talk about the onboarding process and we talk about like putting your best foot forward as a company um you know 
if a company is unaware of what you just mentioned, that DC requires like before you show up on that first day uh, or before you turn on your computer nowadays at home mm-hmm. on your first day, um, you if you want them to be subject to a restrictive covenant, you have to give it to them two weeks ahead of time, 14 yeah. days ahead of time. That's not something that's ever happened before. I mean, so so you're you're in, you have to be in touch with them. You got to know these deadlines. If you become flat-footed and you get off on the wrong foot and you're like, you know, shove this under somebody's nose the first day, it just sets a bad tone. It just yeah. it, it it just makes it very difficult to do. Um, so let me just see if there's anything else we wanted to cover in this. And I'll also say on the restrictive covenant side, if you want to impose that, you um, have to be cons- uh, mindful of salary restrictions as well. Um, certain states, again, have salary thresholds that need to be met before non-compete is effective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you really do, in order to make this process as smooth as possible, you really do need to be very well aware, work with somebody like Amber who knows these things and, <laughs> and, and, and keeps a running uh, tabulation of state <laughs> by state, uh, which, listen, it's very helpful. I mean, it's helped a lot of our clients throughout this process. So um, so that's offer letter versus employment agreements, kind of the first interaction that you have after you've offered a job and they show up. Um, so let's, let's move to the next thing. Uh, somebody shows up for the first day or at least is a new employee the first day. Um, Many of the people watching here today uh, uh, are experienced HR folks who uh, know the I-9 process pretty well. And and first, just at a higher level, what is the I-9 process? Just verifying that they are authorized to work in the United States. Okay. So, so the first day or the first couple of days on the job, you know, you're really supposed to, you're, you're supposed to, you know, sometimes people bring in their passport, yeah. they bring in, you know, it's, it's a list of documents mm-hmm. that the Department of Labor requires um, you to go through to make sure that people are authorized here to work, not U.S. citizens, but that they are authorized to work here in the United States. Mm-hmm. So um, during COVID, tell us how that was handled because people were not interacting face to face. Yeah, so during COVID, Department of Homeland Security gave a little bit more flexibility where you could review the I-9s virtually, but <laughs> that is ending and that ends July the 31st and employers have until the end of August to go back and review those I-9s in person. I was shocked to see that it was really, I mean, I guess you could have started it before the end of uh, July. Mm -hmm. I was shocked to see like a, it's like a 30 day, uh, uh, you know, like period of time in which they can go back and like redo it. I mean, some companies have a ton of employees. I mean, that's a big, big endeavor to do. I I, I wonder if they'll extend right now. The deadline is August 30th of 2023 for them to redo this. Mm -hmm. So just for, for people like me who are very visual, like, when you went during COVID, like normally before COVID, the I-9 process was you sit down with HR, Mm -hmm. you go through and you say, okay, here's my passport. Here's this document. Here's that document. Check, check, check. Everything's good. During COVID, it was I'm on Zoom or I'm on Teams yeah. and I'm holding this up. Picture of my kids. Uh, <laughs> I'm holding this up and, uh, uh, and, and somebody's on the screen looking at it. And obviously, you know, it is an important process. So doing it by that screen way can be fraught with, you know, perhaps somebody who wanted to fudge it a little. Yeah, it, it could. Um, but I will say um, the Department of Homeland Security is looking to maybe add more flexibility in the future. But right now we got to go back to in-person inspections. Yeah. I, I, I'm kind of surprised by this. I think this is I think this is strange. So in other words, what you have to do is you hired a new employee in 2021, right in the middle of COVID. Mm-hmm. You did the virtual I-9 process, hold up your passport, hold up this, you know, put it next to you there like you're at the TSA. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and the person on the other end, the HR specialist is checking the boxes and everything is good and that I-9 process. And now what they're basically going is saying for all those people, now you have to go back by the end of August, yeah. you know, when everybody's at the beach anyway, so I don't know how they're <laughs> going to do this. Um, you're going to, uh, you have to go back and in person, you have to you have to recertify them. Recertify, yes. Okay, and what wh- I mean, what's that process? Just going about it again, like asking in person, reviewing the documents all over again. And of course, a lot of companies have remote employees, and they're not physically there where their employees locate at. So you do have the option of appointing a representative to review the documents 
or having a notary review the documents as well. Okay, so the example I gave, I'm a Virginia-based company. I've got that employee in Colorado. As much as I'd love to go to Colorado, see a concert at Red Rocks, <laughs> everything like that. Um, instead, I can have somebody that I designate. Are there any limitations on who I can designate? Can I have like a, a, a college buddy uh, uh, who lives in Colorado, <laughs> who's a hiker, go over to their house? Well, it, in Colorado, I would say it probably can. California has a little bit more restrictions, but <laughs> If the person is over 18 years old, they can be your company representative. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So as long as you just officially designate them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. And uh, uh, um, so there's a couple of nuances that I thought we should go through. Um, what if an employee who worked at the company and did the I-9 process during COVID is no longer working there? Um, what is that process? Do they then just say, oh, good, we're off the hook. We don't have to redo this? Well, you should go back, um, look at the form and note when their last day of employment was and just describe that they're no longer with the company. Okay. But making sure you add that notation to their I-9 form. Got it. So th so it's not a matter of just ignoring it. Uh, uh, there actually is some additional paperwork for that one. Okay. Um, okay, we already talked about this. What if the company is still uh, uh, fully remote? I mean... On its face, it does say, you know, it, sh it's, it still has to be in person. Mm -hmm. As you noted, it doesn't necessarily have to be in person at the company's headquarters. Correct. It can be done by a designated person, you know, uh, uh, remotely. Yes. Um, but, but it has to be face-to-face, -face, right? Yes. There's no person. exception to that. No, not okay. yet. <laughs> What's interesting is, I mean, some people even moved overseas. Some people moved down to the Caribbean. Some people yeah. moved to Europe and, and are able to do their jobs. Like, you know, so I guess that creates a real hardship. Yeah. It, yeah. There are some vendors that are helping companies navigate through this, but it's a bit of a work to go back and re-verify all those employees since 2020. Got it. So we got entrepreneurs out there that are because of this requirement by the government, which <laughs> I'm going to maybe hold my tongue on it. Uh, 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 they are, uh, entrepreneurs are out there and they're setting up shop and they're, yeah. they're, uh, they're able to do it. Okay. You can find something for everything. Yep. I, mean, <laughs> I had to get my daughter's dog across California. I just, Googled it, and sure enough, there's pet transport companies. So there are people out there that can do anything, anything. you want them to do. Supply and demand. It's Supply a great, and demand. It's a, it's a great country <laughs> we're in. Okay, so that's I-9. I'm trying to see any questions on this one. Not that I can see. Okay. Um, so, okay. So you've got them. You've got, their, you've got their document that sets forth their terms and conditions of employment. Mm-hmm. You've established, you've, you've solidified your uh, Department of Labor I-9 check of the employee. You've done the recertification. Well, you'll be busy in August doing that <laughs> recertification, I guess. Um, and so one of the next documents that comes up that I think helps to create an impression for the company uh, is the uh, is the employee handbook. Um, talk a little bit about like sort of what's a high level purpose of the employee handbook. It's really to provide guidelines and a general summary of the benefits offered by the company and then also expectations. Again, pretty high level. It doesn't need to go into too much detail except for maybe as it relates to pay time off or um, insurance benefits. Yeah, it's very, it is quite a bit different than what we talked about at the beginning, which is an employment agreement or an offer letter. I mean, that's a little bit more contractual in nature. Mm -hmm. um, an employee handbook is not intended to be a contract. And so the language that you're going to see in there, um, you're going to have legal review that handbook, but it's usually that's a document that's going to be created inside the company. Um, my experience is that, you know, HR really wants to capture um, sort of the spirit and and, and the uh, uh, culture of the company right from the right from the beginning in that uh, employee handbook. Yes, I agree as well. Yeah, so you'll often open up a handbook and it'll be actually kind of like a welcome letter. You know, mm -hmm. here's and here's our mission statement mission and statement. here's our yeah. So mm -hmm. it's it, it is quite a bit different. Um, you mentioned leave benefits. Um, talk to me about like what we expect to see in a handbook when it comes to leave. Um, vacation, pay time off, um, however you want to phrase it. Sick leave um, is very important to include, especially with all the state law requirements and making sure those policies are either um, 
comply with all the states you're operating in or having separate policies for those employees in different states that may yeah. have be more more restrictions yeah we've we've really worked with our clients on this because it used to be that you could have a one size fits all employee handbook but as we've noted throughout this discussion so far employees are all over the place in yeah. the united states and sometimes even beyond um so what's the best way to deal with that can you can you have a one size fits all or or is there a, a, a relatively easy fix for that you, you can if you want to you can definitely have a one size fits all or you can have state addendums that are incorporated into the handbook for those employees located out of your home state <laughs> So everybody, so in a case like that, and that's how we've been really doing it, and mm -hmm. I think it's worked out well for our clients, it makes it easy because, um, you know, that way if you add a new state, if somebody says, hey, I'm moving to uh, Washington State, we can then just create a new Washington State addendum mm -hmm. that would just get basically attached to the, uh, to the handbook. So all employees get the regular one-size-fits-all handbook, and then the addenda, whatever state is relevant, they would then get that too, just the, those yeah. employees. Mm -hmm. I mean, because the problem is if you try to put it all in one handbook, some states give very generous stuff and it's mandated by law. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so what you're going to have here is uh, uh, you're going to have an employee in Virginia look at an employee in Massachusetts and say, if you happen to work in Massachusetts, here's all the other goodies that you get yeah. by virtue of being an employee. So it really does not make sense to try to encapsulate that in one. It's I hate to say, it, but it's just bad for morale. It's the employment system that we're operating under right now where states are just going and doing their own things. Yeah, and I would say especially with parental leave, that's a big one that's popping up now on a state by state basis. Yeah. Um, and so um, talk about like, okay, you want to be specific when it comes to your leave laws and you want to have these addenda that talk about the various laws that can be changed pretty easily without mm -hmm. having to change the big document. Um, but what about other things? Is it good to be specific when you're talking about discipline, grievances and things of that nature? No, I would say keep it more general just to give the company more um <laughs> more flexibility in how they handle each um, situation based on the circumstances. Yeah, I've seen, I think it's less and less now, but I have seen handbooks in the past where, you know, it's like you need a roadmap to figure out like a disciplinary action. You know, within five days, you're going to do this. And within 10 days, the employee is going to bring this back. And, and, you know, and, and it really just comes back to bite frankly, a company, uh, uh, if they don't comply to the to the absolute letter of it. So it's best, I think you're right, it's best just to keep it fairly flexible. Use words like may a lot in an employment yeah. agreement. Uh, I'm sorry, in an employee handbook. handbook. In an employment agreement, you <laughs> shall. Uh, yes. In an employee handbook, use a lot more may. Mm -hmm. Like even just stuff like employment reviews. Um, don't say, uh, you know, you're going to get reviewed every year or every half a year or every quarter, you know, however your company does it, don't draw that line in the sand because we all know things happen. We know pandemics sometimes happen. Like mm -hmm. you can't always endeavor to, to, to do everything. So just say the company shall or, or may endeavor, you know, things along those lines that give the company a little bit more flexibility. Yeah. And I think the biggest point is always the ham a handbook is not a contract. Yes. So along those lines, a question that I get a lot is, should I be putting things like a confidentiality provision in, a, in an employment handbook? I would say no, since that is a contractual term that we may need to enforce later on. So that's better served in an employment agreement rather than a handbook. Okay. Yeah. Because again, you're not, you don't sign an employee handbook to say this is a contract. Most of those are acknowledgement uh, uh, sheets that basically say, you know, I'm, I, I acknowledge that I've received them, that I'll abide by the company's policies and procedures, mm -hmm. but it's still not a contract uh, uh, the way we think of it as enforceable in yes. court. Um, I, uh, uh, how often would you say like a, a, an employee handbook should be updated? Once a year, because things tend to change pretty fast with certain states. So going back and just doing an annual review is very helpful. Yeah. I mean, even just like, you know, even just protected categories. Now there are ways if companies, you know, don't want, you know, your look, companies, you know, are, are, can be on tight budget sometimes. And so there are ways to build more flexibility into a, a, a handbook. So if you don't have the budget to do that legal review every year, and if you want to do it every second or every third year, uh, but you don't 
want that handbook to become very stale. One thing that I recommend to companies a lot is like, like let's just take protected classifications, mm -hmm. you know, race, gender, religion, you know, nationality, all, all the, all the ones, a uh, uh, disability age, you know, all the ones that, you know, it started off with a certain list and then the list continues to grow. There's a way to do a catch all at the end of it to say, and any other protected categories or classifications under state, federal, or local applicable fates to federal state or local laws. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Then you kind of swoop in all these other things and you don't have an outdated document. Uh, yep. Definitely agree. Including that catch all phrase at the end. And then also, you know, one other thing, we, we talk about state law a lot, but we also have to be mindful of the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, and <laughs> that consistently changes and including a savings clause <laughs> as well as saying, you know, this is not intended to conflict with any Section 7 rights. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so the National Labor Relations Board, which tends to change and become either employee friendly or management friendly, company friendly, depending on which administration is in office at any given time. And it really makes it tough for companies because it really is kind of a seesaw back and forth. Yeah. It's like, you know, uh, uh, under the current administration, it's probably a lot more employee friendly. And so there are a lot of changes that are going on right now. If there is another administration at some point, uh, uh, again, it may swing back the other way. And then, you know, you're, you're, you're putting stuff in, you're taking stuff out. Mm -hmm. It really does make it uh, make it difficult. Um, the one thing where it does, where you should really have clear things, is for harassment and discrimination reporting. Like, what's that? What, what would you expect or want to see in a handbook for that? Yeah, providing an avenue or channel for the employee to communicate any issues with um, having either you know an email address or a person they should contact if there's any issues. Yeah, and 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 actually having like multiple people mm -hmm. uh, because I've seen handbooks that do a couple of things. I've seen handbooks that have one person uh, or one position that is the reporting. Like, so let's just say an employee or or a witness to discrimination, either somebody who feels they've been discriminated against or somebody who has witnessed somebody else being discriminated against or harassed on the job. Um, who do they report it to? And this is critical because the handbook, whoever that reporting person is, if the employee ends up not following that, that is actually a defense for the company later on down the yeah. line. Um, so don't be too specific. Don't say it should be reported to Jane, um, you know, uh, uh, because guess what? Jane might not be there when that handbook is still in effect. Yep. Or that should be reported to the, um, to the director of human resources, okay? Maybe the company changes that and calls that person the chief uh, uh, people officer down the road. Be, be flexible um, in who you can report those to. Okay, so employee handbooks, setting clear expectations. Um, uh, let's see, is there anything else we want to cover there? I think we got everything. Yes. Okay, uh, probationary periods. Um, let's let's just talk generally about that. What is a probationary period that we see sometimes? Sometimes in handbooks or offer letters, it, the company would say, you know, you are on probation for 90 days, and maybe during that time period, you're not eligible for benefits, or um, you can't use vacation. So there may be certain um, restrictions placed during that first 90 day period while they're training you and you know getting a feel for a working style. Yeah, I've always been torn on these. Um, I've I've all I've been torn basically first off on the name probation has a negative connotation yeah. uh, uh, in a, you know so you're starting off the employment relationship on probation you know and I know that that's not the that that's not the goal of this um, but I but I've always been torn about it I I, I say if you're going to have them call it maybe an introductory period or a what I mean I don't know if there's any other names or I think I like introductory period <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 but then but then like talk about this because like you, so the point of a probationary period is like you know if, if you're not happy with them you can let them go but they're at will employees anyways day 91 92 93 they're also technically you know probationary because they're always going to be at always will at will yeah that's the again stressing that this does not change the at will nature at all yeah yeah so what would be a benefit have you seen 
uh, uh, um, like uh, our clients, what have you seen a benefit or where they might use those that would make sense? I get, if it's tied to certain benefits that you can't or, that you can't use until after the ninety days ends or sixty days ends. Okay, so like let's just say you know they're given uh, uh, pay time off, like mm -hmm. most companies offer that of some sort, whether it's unlimited or whether it's a defined pay time off pro program. Um, if they, uh, it, it, so in other words, you're saying during that first 90 days, you're not allowed to take time off. I, I think that's reasonable. You know, you, you know, people, unless they have pre-planned events or whatever. Yeah. That, yeah. That yeah. The company's aware of, you know, can accrue it, but maybe not actually being able to use it until after the 90 days. Yeah. So I have, um, I have, I have softened on the use of these, especially if it's like you just said, mm -hmm. if it's tied to something, I have softened on the use of these because I think even from a non-legal standpoint, they're not legally enforceable. You know, I mean, it's not like you can on day 91, you have this expectation of any further employment that you did on day 89, mm -hmm. uh, when you were still on a probationary period. Um, but I do think that it is, it's, it, it, it's from an optic standpoint, it does help to set the tone that look, yeah, we're, we're both kind of feeling each other out during this period of time, mm -hmm. you know, bring your A game and we know the company too, that they need to bring their A game. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, what about, I mean, do, do we need to create a full probationary policy if we have a probationary period? Uh, maybe not a full policy. I, again, just outlining what benefits or, you know, leave can't be used during that period. Yeah. Making sure that's clear for the new employee. Yeah. I think as long as you set expectations, I think the whole need for a, a, a separate policy at some point it becomes overkill. Mm -hmm. You can't have too many standalone policies. You can't have too many things. So, um, I think, uh, you're right. No, no separate need for a probationary policy. You can put that in the handbook, but you also want to put that in the offer letter or the employment agreement if you use those or both if you use both. Yes. Okay. Now we are turning to a favorite topic of ours. <laughs> <laughs> um, special considerations for remote hybrid workforce. Um, why don't you just start talking about it? There's so many issues. <laughs> there's, there's a lot. Yes. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, one thing that we know we stress, making sure you're aware where the, where the employees actually perform the service at. And then, you know, that may trigger some doing business qualifications where you may need to register in, in that state. So that's an important consideration to take in to yeah. account as well. Yeah. How about, how about, um, like employee privacy and like, you know, bring your own device type policies, mm -hmm. um, whether you're on a hybrid model where people are bringing in their own laptop or whatever, like what are some of the considerations since, since you're not tethered full time under these situations, you're not tethered full time to let's say our offices here. Mm -hmm. Generally, if the employee is using company property, there's no expectation of um, privacy. Even if they're, even Generally. if they're doing uh, like uh, 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 Amazon shopping on their work uh, a laptop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no okay. expectation of privacy since you're using company property. Okay. Yes. I need to take note of that. <laughs> um, anyways. Uh, okay. So that's a great point. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, if they bring in their personal laptops or whatever, I mean, yeah, that, that look, there's, there's, there's got to be some common sense in this process. I mean, if the, if the, if the company is really looking to uh, uh, engage in that much surveillance, I mean, there might be a different issue there, but, but, but that's true. If you're using company cell phone, laptop. Mm -hmm. the, the, the standard phrase that we use all the time, as you just noted, is there's no expectation of privacy when you're using company uh, uh, equipment. And um, I would go back and say that's something we would like to see in handbooks as well, just making that clear to the employees when you're using company property, no expectation of privacy. Yeah. One of the things like, you know, so much of this onboarding process is just making sure that you get started on the right foot. Like, the employee is looking at companies and it's basically is looking at their new employer. You know, they're thinking, Oh my gosh, I, you know, I left my last job and I'm, 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 I'm now, you know, sort of committed to this next company. If you don't have your stuff in order, if the onboarding process does not go smoothly, um, it sends a very bad signal and it's hard to recoup that. It makes you look disorganized. Yeah. It makes you, and, and, and then they start to question the business itself. Like, you know, if this is how you run internal operations, 
How are external operations going? That's why all of this stuff is very important. I mean, if you don't give somebody an employment agreement until three weeks in, if you don't give them a handbook, uh, you know, in, in their first year, if you don't, you know, all this delays just makes it seem like it makes it seem like they're not organized yeah. and also that they don't care. I agree. It, it definitely sends, you know, a bad message from the start of the employment. Yeah. It's very important. Um, okay, so let's just see. What else do we have when it comes to uh, uh, hybrid workforce? Um, how about uh, state laws that have come into play uh, uh, about these high, these remote workplace uh, 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 you know arrangements? Yes, some states require employers to reimburse employees for all reasonable expenses occurred, even if they're remote. So that's something to take in consideration, maybe putting in place a reimbursement policy up to a certain amount or a monthly stipend for those remote workers' expenses. Okay. Like Virginia, where we're here right now, uh, I don't believe they're one of the states that have jumped on that bandwagon so far, right? Correct. Virginia, okay. no. But D.C., Yes. Okay. California, and, uh, yes. California, <laughs> yes. And, and, and last time I looked, it did look like there was sort of a growing chorus of states um, that were requiring these uh, uh, reimbursement. In other words, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, up until then, you know, pre-COVID, companies largely had headquarters. They supplied everything. There's a huge cost in that. By going remote, companies, in essence, have a little bit of a windfall because they no longer have, if they go fully remote, no longer have lease payments, no longer have all the day-to-day -day costs that it takes to run like an mm -hmm. office. Um, and so I think what these states are basically saying is somebody's bearing those costs, yeah. like, you know, for your employees. And I think what they're finding is inevitably the remote employee who's working from home is incurring certain costs that are just like, you know, they're just natural costs. And so I guess that's what the state legislators are doing, right? Yeah. Uh, they're looking, you know, is this for the company's benefit? Therefore, you know, the employee should be reimbursed for that amount for certain expenses though, as long as it's reasonable and, um, and, and in line with your duties that you're performing. So now we get to the, we talked about onboarding obviously. And, 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 but one thing I think that helps at the beginning of the employment relationship is to set expectation when you're talking about remote or hybrid employees to set expectations as to how company equipment is going to be returned. You would think that this is not a hard issue. <laughs> I can tell you from personal experience, as many in the hallways here at Barron's Wag Leonard can also tell you uh, uh, that uh, with our clients, um, uh, there have been difficulties in this. And it, it's, it's surprising. You've got a remote employee that's working in another state, and it's not as easy as just saying, hey, return your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what are some things that companies can do at the, in the onboarding at the outset of the employment to maybe help that process? I would say, you know, one, tracking the equipment, making sure you have the serial number um, and who, which employee it's going to. But then also, um, you know, maybe putting in your handbook saying, you know, uh, PTO won't be paid out unless you return all your equipment within three days after um, your last day of employment. But of course, that is dependent on state law requirements as well. Yeah, you hate that you have to dangle a carrot to get back what is just company property. I mean, you know, again, companies always will send a pre prepaid you know shipping label. It's not like they want the employee or the former employee to incur a cost. Um, but I agree. I think if you handle this at the outset, if you say, like, let's just say a lot of times companies in their employee handbook will say, um, we will pay out your unused but accrued paid time off. Um, and, and sometimes they just stop right there. We'll pay out, you know, I always say, you know what, like get a little something for that. Like say, I would put a thing, assuming you are fully compliant with all of our policies and procedures, including our return of company equipment policy, mm -hmm. you know, just some kind of an incentive, some kind of a stick, I guess, to get an employee to return that stuff. I mean, I think they can do that at the beginning. Yes, and depending on the state. <laughs> we can't use it for all states, See, of course. this is the thing. You always tell me that there's a state. What states do I need to stay out of? California. No. <laughs> I've got a daughter in California. I can't stay out of California. Uh, but uh, uh, does California not allow that? You, in California, PTO is wages, so 
do not deduct touch it's wages sacrosanct. at okay. all. Do not okay. touch it. <laughs> no <Okay>. deductions from wages. <laughs> so I'm just trying to think. So, so in some of these states, maybe you got to get a little bit more creative. Maybe it's um, uh, you're not going to get a, a, a bonus uh, until that's pay uh, until company equipment. I, I, I'm just trying to come up with something. It depends if the bonus is earned. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. See, this Sorry. is why this is why we work so well together because you always put me in check, which I think is good. Um, and then let's see. A question that came up is, can we re revoke a work for hire agreement if we want to have all staff back in the office? Uh, can you revoke a, a work from home agreement? Yeah, you I said work for hire, yeah. right? <laughs> work for home. Don't worry, we're not live. We'll just edit that out, Todd. <laughs> yes, you could if you wanted to. Um, I mean, it's, it's within the company's discretion. I don't know how that would help employee morale, but yes. you can definitely do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's an important point because, you know, obviously as lawyers, we see things, you know, through a legal lens often. But I think what makes us, what, why our clients like us is because we, we, we sometimes are able to look beyond that legal lens and say, okay, yes, legally you can do that. But guess what? Have you thought about the optics of this? Uh, uh, have you thought that like, you know, this is going to be, uh, uh, you know, a morale killer, yeah. you know? So if you say, and, 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 and this has been interesting, let's, let's spend the last few minutes that we have. Let me see what time is one forty. Yeah. We'll probably end a little bit early. Um, but let's spend the last few minutes just talking about some of the challenges that we have seen from companies out there who are now in 2023 trying to get a handle on, do we bring people back or don't we bring people back? Yeah, I think the uh, biggest thing, if, especially if you're going hybrid, having kind of a set schedule when everyone's in the office to make it more meaningful and worthwhile. It, it, you know, if you're coming in and you're the only one in there, you're like, why am I here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it is. Uh, so getting back to that question, you know, can you revoke a work from home agreement? You know, I, I haven't seen any uh, like companies that I've been involved with uh, uh, do that just about face. Uh, you know, fully remote, and then one day just wake up and say, you know, uh, uh, you're all coming back. I, I always equate it to be like a, being a parent. If you're a permissive parent, which I probably have been accused of, <laughs> if you're a permissive parent, kids go to bed whenever you want to. And then all of a sudden you just say, uh, you know, one day everybody goes to bed at 10 o'clock. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not the way, it's not going to engender respect. It's not going to engender good morale. You can do it as an authority. Sure, you can try, um, but it's probably not the best way to do it. Yeah, I, I would suggest giving notice, maybe 30 days notice. Like, I'd, hey, I'd bump it even more because people need, days, people yeah. need, I mean, people may need to ma uh, make uh, 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 childcare arrangements of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are extra time involved in coming into the workplace. Uh, pet arrangements, things yes. of that nature. Um, Everyone not all, get their COVID pet, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> not all companies like uh, uh, Barron's Wag Leonard let their dogs come into work. Uh, <laughs> we don't do it all the time, but we should. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so those are all the different, I mean, this is less of a legal discussion and more of a practical discussion yeah. of you need to do this in the right way. And, and I do agree with you. I think if the more nebulous the policy is, if it's like we want you in two days a week, well, that may have no overlap with people. And so therefore it doesn't even accomplish what you're looking for it to accomplish. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and I also agree with you that like when they are in on those days, make it worthwhile. It doesn't mean you're running a daycare where you have to just like, you know, <laughs> hold everybody's hand throughout the entire day, but do something that's going to, that's going to create engagement within the workplace. Yeah. You know, I think that makes the most sense. Okay. Sorry. See, we're uh, getting questions here. Of course, I have to log in. Right. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> oh, <laughs> is, is California a state to stay out of? What about New York and Texas? Wow. Well, okay. I'm from Texas. <laughs> yeah, Texas. And you're here in Virginia, so yes. clearly you made that decision. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> I, well, I would say Texas does not have as many em employment regulations as California. California probably has the most out of all of the states and there are certain states following their trend. Colorado's one. New York is, I would say halfway. Yeah. They're on the verge of banning non-competes. So yeah, that's but then something to when they do something like of. banning non-competes, like I I'm not so sure who that helps. And so I don't know yeah. if that's always an employee thing, an employer thing. I think it just depends on Who's at issue in that particular yeah. fact, you know? <laughs> um, it's an interesting question. Um, I, you know, I, 
I don't I don't think you should have I think you should probably if you want if you want less regulations in your employee relationships um, I think it's fine to try as po- much as possible to minimize. I, I struggle myself, and I've talked to people about this, as to whether or not you should have absolute bans. I think even those states might even consider that in some ways retaliatory. Um, and so you got to be careful about that. Um, but listen, it's a very real issue. I mean, you know, it's there's no bias there. It's really just, you know, these are states that have taken very aggressive moves that they believe protects their – this is me on my soapbox, by the way <laughs> – that they believe protects their employees – um, and yet we see in real life that what really happens is companies are reluctant. I mean, that question came from somebody. Clearly, that's front and center of many of our clients' minds. That company now might not hire there. I don't know how that helps engender a robust workforce in California if the legislator is passing laws that are causing companies to steer away from it. So I, I personally think, but I wouldn't do an outright ban. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're limiting your qualified candidates. Yeah, I would say just be mindful about the regulations that come with um, California employees, just so you know, you're on top of it, because we don't want, you know, wage claim later on and um, all the penalties associated with that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it will come with more administrative costs. There's no doubt about it. Having a California uh, uh, employee or employees uh, will inevitably come with more administrative costs, perhaps uh, uh, increased benefits costs, things of that nature. So I guess what I would say is you need to do a cost benefit like analysis of, um, you know, is this a talent that I really need uh, uh, on board at the company. And, it, and, it, and, and in, if it is, then maybe I'm willing to take on that extra administrative and yeah. uh, uh, expense of a burden. Um, but if not, if it's interchangeable, if you can find somebody here in Virginia, which used to be a lot more em, uh, employer friendly, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's going a little bit middle of the road right now, but that's okay. I, we're, not, we're not seeing it too bad. It's still, it's still number two in the country doing business, so it's still a great place to do business for companies, and we see that with people relocating here all the time. Um, but, uh, uh, but if it's between those two, uh, yeah, I think it makes common sense, business sense to probably hire the Virginia person over the California person if it's an apples to apples comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, uh, assuming no more text message. Uh, no. Um, well, 45 minutes. Good. I think that that's. Uh, oh, one more. Send it right at saved by the bell. <laughs> All right. Let me just see because I'm blind. Yeah, so this is a this is a good question. Okay. In a remote environment, how do you engage employees to get them more involved in the company through the onboarding process? So we're not just talking about like, you know, once they're on board here, but we're talking about through the onboarding process. You want to take the first stab at that? I'll let you have it. Okay, I got it. <laughs> uh, 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 um, I would say that uh, 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 even though you may have a remote environment uh, or, or a hybrid environment, mm-hmm. um, I think that you have got to establish in face um, a, a relationship with that new employee. You cannot make this an entirely remote onboarding process. Um, if you don't have a company headquarters, I know it makes it more difficult um, to uh, you know to have them come to you know a specific office or whatever. But you got to be creative um, because if they don't make that human connection, if they don't make that um, you know, so you should be meeting with these people. You know, even if it's a, a like a, you know Regis office space, you know the the the, the WeWorks or whatever. Um, most remote companies have those. I think they should meet the executive staff face to face during that onboarding process. I think they should meet their managers and their immediate coworkers in a face to face environment. Those should involve both, you know, uh, uh, more formal workplace, uh, uh, you know, meetings, uh, uh, but also have some fun. You know, go out for a happy hour or stuff like that. I think if it's done totally remote, I think it's really, really tough to 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 then make that culture uh, be a little bit more ingrained when it becomes fully remote. Yeah, I definitely agree. Having that personal one-on-one connection definitely helps in the long run. Yeah. And I think it's also communication because again, not everything happens uh, uh, in person. Um, This is where those documents that we talked about are so important. You know, you should have that employment agreement, that handbook, all of those documents, you should really have those ready to go on day one or before day one as much as possible so that the employee understands who am I working for? Um, what is the culture of this place? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, uh, that's where you have to 
necessary. I mean, for remote employees, most of the ones, most of the remote workforces that I know about from clients, they have a very robust, I call it an intranet. I'm sure it's like, you know, uh, uh, such a different thing from the dinosaur that I am when it comes to technology, <laughs> but like an intranet, like, like something where there's a lot of engagement that's going on. They're learning about like what's going on in the company. Some companies have these newsletters that they put out. Just something that makes you feel proud that you're actually a part of something and that you're not just somebody that's just sitting here and you get a different paycheck that's at the top of, you know, you know, different company at the top of your paycheck. Yep. Excellent question. Um, that is, I mean, I'm not surprised that the questions that we have received largely centered around um, remote and hybrid workplaces because, you know, COVID brought those front and center and uh, they're here to stay. They're here to stay at our law firm. Um, uh-oh, did I put that on that? Yeah. Jenny, sorry. I, I let the cat out of the bag there. Uh, but they are. And I think they are great. I think they work perfectly, um, uh, uh, especially if you do it right. I mean, so, you know, th this is a discussion, an ongoing discussion. Yeah, I was actually reading an article this morning um, that said companies that are either hybrid or remote saw a higher employee count than companies that were fully in office, which is interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, well, first off, you know, from a budget standpoint, point, it, it might free up some of these administrative expenses, lease expenses, rent expenses. It might free up the ability to go ahead and hire more people. Mm -hmm. um, and you're able to cast a much wider net. So, you know, even some of these DEI initiatives, uh, uh, um, th th you know, the purpose of a DEI initiative is not to have a quota. It is to expand the relevant labor pool so that when you're making that hire based on merit, you've got a lot more people in the mix that you can choose from. Yep. Um, and, and, and you can do that a lot more when you can hire, you know, when we can hire somebody from Colorado, New Hampshire, or wherever, and we're not just limited to, you know, the specific surroundings of our, of our uh, headquarters here. Well, Amber, thank you so much for joining me. I think thank we're uh, I think we're done with questions. Uh, uh, listen, everybody, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for 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 being here and for listening and for those that are listening on video. These are great topics. If you ever have any questions, you ever want to bounce anything off of us, uh, uh, you can reach us through you know Berenswijk Leonard uh, website or um, you know just uh, social media. Anything, we're always out there. Um, always happy to talk about it, and uh, we look forward to. Hopefully, you'll join us for the next one. We probably have the next one coming up in uh, Q4. Um, and we'll announce that topic on social media uh, uh, shortly. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.